happy hour! Yay! Thanks, everybody, for sticking around. So I'm going to be talking about open data and cities. Hi, everybody. Glad you stuck around. Um, so what is that funny little path there? Uh, that's a grant that I run called geothink.ca. It is uh, $6 million, 26 researchers, including um, Mookie Hackley, who's been a staple here at um, OpenStreetMap, uh, partners uh, that include um, USGS and OpenStreetMap. Uh, so we're looking at how cities talk to citizens via the geospatial web and open data. We've got about six themes. They include um, what happens to participation, participation when anyone can participate at any time and from any place. Um, what are the implications for social justice? What are the implications for the evolution of data standards and accuracy? Uh, what are the legal ramifications? And yes, we have a couple of law professors on this grant. Um, and uh, what is the political economy? Uh, this technological ecosystem of many, many different companies and civil society members, large and small, as well as cities. So, um, little advertisement. We need graduate students and I need postdocs. So I've got about four and a half years left. So any of you are interested, um, email me or uh, tweet me. So just to give you a little bit of background about the sort of stuff that I do, I'm really interested in what's called public participation GIS and the ability for non-experts to be empowered by uh, um, these technologies that no one ever thought that non-experts could use. This is a, a platform that one of my students, Pierre Boudreau, built called You Say City, which is a threaded uh, discussion platform uh, the number of cities are now using in the world um, on 3D, um, against 3D buildings. Uh, this is another one that's being done with CrowdMap. Uh, Heather's met uh, Anna, uh, and she's been looking at whether CrowdMap and texting can be used for community development. <clears throat> so this is the basis of our grant how cities with their open data, their data portals, their streaming surface services can talk to uh, citizens with volunteer geographic information, VGI, to the geospatial web and apps. And the hope, of course, is that when you bring these two things together, magic happens. Whether that magic is improved service delivery or better uh, service, uh, better decision making or economic development or transparency. And what I'm particularly interested in is empowerment of marginalized people and uh, democracy. Uh, <clears throat> open data. I know that you all know this, but it just should uh, be re-emphasized that it is about data that's freely available uh, to reuse and republish without restrictions. Uh, so uh, already you can see there are legal implications of open data in cities. Um, it's a massively complicated process in Canada, if not in the United States. And like, if we could bend each other's ear about the licensing challenges of uh, accessing municipal data in both countries. And a bunch of people have mentioned VGI. Well, here's a definition of VGI for you uh, from my good child, Anama Budatoki, who was in my lab a couple of years ago. And he also, Nama did the first um, assessment of motivations to use and to contribute to OpenStreetMap. And he presented a couple of years ago here. So that's uh, large numbers of uh, participants 
uh, who are generally considered to be non-experts uh, and have little formal coordination with each other. Um, so, um, I don't know, if, it's, uh, if I'm standing here as an academic, it's you. If I'm sitting in the audience, it's my own and it's us. Uh, so, that's, uh, academics are really interested in what it means for volunteered contributions, for crowdsourcing, um, and uh, their ability to possibly um, improve um, emergency management, as we heard, or um, people's experiences in parks. Uh, we've built, by the way, very elaborate models. This is a model of open da data development in cities. <clears throat> so this is what some of our research looks like. This is also what some of our research looks like um, to interview cities in Canada. We have about uh, 20 of the major cities in Canada involved in this project. Um, and uh, they get involved with volunteer contributions, with uh, putting their data out for people to use in uh, hackathons um, and by social entrepreneurs. And it's always nice to see you when there's a kind of a reciprocity. And uh, not only is the data used, but it starts to be reused uh, internally. So when you see transit commissioners using the applications that uh, developers from uh, civil society, for example, have uh, built. So how well do city open data and OSM play together? Well, the short answer is not very well at all. We can hope that it gets better over time. But it all depends. Um, okay, the first thing that a city official will say when I come to them, and I think, Richard, you were, you had the same uh, experience. When they come to them, you say, there's this great data set and platform out there called OpenStreetMap. You're telling me that anyone can edit this map at any time? No, there's no way that I'm going to use it. Because this isn't to say, I'm not uh, going to stand up here and say city data is great, and Wookie Hackley has done a lot of work to show that um, open street map data can be superior uh, to municipal data. But when they think that they can see stuff like this, where there are two highway roads that don't ever overlap but are essentially the same road, or they see uh, bug fixes that uh, aren't remedied, they get scared. So it's uh, an interesting hurdle to try to get them to at least entertain the idea to accept uh, data from volunteers. There's also incompatible, incompatibilities with parts of OSM like um, how items are tagged. And there's obviously not a forest in an industrial site. So um, if we are to advance at all in integrating OSM with municipalities, how might we do it to address issues of data accuracy? Uh, one of my colleagues, Peter Johnson, is looking at models of OSM and city data convergence um, so at least um, cities can potentially access OSM data. Uh, obviously the first one which has the highest uh, level of government control is for cities to do nothing and but at least they're opening up their data through separate silos and we actually see that we're starting to see that where uh, cities are mashing up their data with OSM data, um, but never the twain shall meet. So they collect data on top of OpenStreetMap data, uh, but that data may never make it into OpenStreetMap and may never actually make it into their GIS data sets. Um, 
all the way up to crowdsource. Um, Alex talked about uh, Mapbox. I'm going to talk about data curation in just a minute. That's what Peter is really interested in, ways in which, and he's built a prototype model for uh, the city of Waterloo and Kitchener to try out to um, be able to accept uh, data, um, new features from OpenStreetMap, at least integrated into their official um, GIS database. Um, I don't know whether I should show the next slide. I said, sure. <laughs> I said the data accuracy is huge, a huge problem for cities, but actually accuracy, at least I do this in my classes, accuracy is not the first objective of any of this. Why? Uh, cities must obviously want accuracy, right? Not necessarily, because accuracy is entirely dependent upon its use. It's not an issue of precision of the number of digits in a lat long. It's what are you going to use it for? So in a city, accuracy is not the first objective. Credentials provide the accuracy, and I'm not totally not, so be, be careful when you tweet. Don't, maybe, don't tweet any of that. Okay. Uh, C credentials provide the accuracy. What does that mean? It means the citizen cannot go out and physically check every data point, every X, Y that there is. But because there's been an infrastructure of education and credentialing, that could be good or bad, um, you can be somewhat assured, and there's a stamp, you can be somewhat assured that there is some kind of accuracy measure. In OpenStreetMap, eyeballs provide the accuracy. So many eyeballs looking at the data, the data is refined, um, and it becomes more accurate. Um, well, that's accuracy can't necessarily even be achieved under eyeballs. I live in Canada. Canada is fairly accurate within 100 miles, but once you get out there, it's, it's another thing entirely. So you don't necessarily even have the eyeballs to um, ensure the accuracy of the data. Then they talk about data structure. Second thing they say is it doesn't match our GIS. There's no way that we can integrate it. And uh, the reason that I bring this up is that cities are not like other levels of government, especially with regard to OSM, uh, especially in the United States. Cities have invested huge amounts of money in GIS. And because they've invested huge amounts of money in GIS, and there's a huge learning curve in learning GIS, an, and it has legal stamps on it, they're not willing to give it up and replace it or necessarily bring in pieces from elsewhere. Not the least of which <clears throat> they've figured out through trial and error what the underlying topology is and the geometry. So they fixed those geometric problems and for better or worse, government data is at least better in its underlying topology and geometry. And you don't have these weird things of um, complex objects that you get in OSM in um, the municipal and other government databases. Although I can tell you about twisted polygons for um, uh, postal codes in Canada. So there's still a lot of geometry problems uh, in some government data. <clears throat> okay, so yet another thing they'll talk about is they'll say, oh, um, OSM, VGI, oh, it's volunteers. Okay, so it brings in the V and VGI, the volunteers. Uh, what does that mean to government? Um, by the way, this is uh, from my student Anna Branducescu once again. Uh, one of the ways that she introduced uh, all of this technology was she actually built a lot of uh, cartoons to introduce uh, OpenStreetMap. So, two cities, participation in volunteerism looks like this. So, VGI is not OSM. Um, 
And it's not participation necessarily. Why do I say that? Because in that previous example, it would be like Leah or Elizabeth raising their hands and saying, I have a problem with that land use designation. Um, OSM comes in, it's, it's actually more like framework data, like the Federal Geographic Data Committee. Uh, it's not perceptions, citizen perceptions or reporting of a pothole. It's big data, but it's not stream big data. Um, it's not what cities are used to in terms of a volunteer. So this is radically new terrain for them, which is why it's nice to have companies like Mapbox emerge, because one of the advantages is that they can put this professional uh, wrapping around OSM. Uh, and that's debatable also whether that's a good thing or not, but cities know how to work with private sector. They don't know how to eat wholesale accept uh, data that comes from volunteers. So as I said, a lot of apps look like this. Uh, a lot of uh, OSM use in cities looks like this. <clears throat> Another issue for cities is are you going to stick around to continue editing our data and refining our data? Right? Maybe you're going to stick around. Uh, so, so um, Nama Budahoki looked at the uh, motivations for people to participate in OpenStreetMap. And he found that pride of, let's see, the data must be free was number one. Uh, pride of place was number two. And then there was a mix of um, uh, status and fun. And there's a whole variety of really interesting motivations why people contribute. But a lot of people contribute because it's the undiscovered country. They like it because there's a lot of blank space. Especially in North America and places in Europe, there's increasingly less blank space. So the motivations for um, adding are different from the motivations for refining existing data and for adding new features. So um, Alan McConkie calls this map gardening. So there can be slightly different uh, reasons why you want to do this and cities want to know what those reasons are because they want people to keep editing, right? Uh, <clears throat> so they worry that maybe people will stop contributing and one reason they hold on to their GIS data sets is because they are legally mandated for certain things. You can't just say, here, use this stuff. No, they have to make sure that their, uh, the data set is complete, it's verifiable, it's verified and verifiable, and it serves the last mile. Uh, one of the things that Mookie has found, Mookie Heckley has found unfortunately, is there is still a digital divide in what gets mapped in OpenStreetMap. So places that people want to go get mapped, uh, places where people want to be get mapped, and not, where pla not places where people don't want to pee, be and don't want to go. Okay. <clears throat> so they're worried about, uh, no disrespect to Foursquare, but they're worried about essentially the Foursquareification of uh, contributions, that there will be tons of users and not many contributors. They're also worried about provenance. <clears throat> Right? Uh, they're legally mandated to know the history of their data. This is for the province of Alberta. Um, the data comes from all over the place. Some of the places that they're no longer allowed to come from. Um, so they need to control the source of the data and that can be problematic. Oh. Some of the data may actually come from government through data dumps, but it net, might not come from the right level, right level of data, uh, right level of government, sorry. So that may be a problem for a municipality if it's coming from a national, from the Canadian national government or the provincial government. Jurisdictionality matters. Sometimes you have to know where your contributors live 
And sometimes you have to restrict contributions to those people. And you might say, that's terrible, Renee. People should be able to contribute from wherever they are and at any time. They shouldn't have to go to town meeting X and city Y. <clears throat> but citizens have fought for the right to participate in government. And there are very strong rules. But those rules don't change very fast. Just why Richard's having problems with this. I'm just going up there, hey, free stuff. Why don't you like my free stuff? Right, because there are lots and lots of rules that have been built over the years that allow us to have any kind of conversation with cities and to get any kind of data from cities. Uh, so, case in point, in Canada, 63 of the data imports are done by less than 25 users in the entire country. Oh, and most of them were not from Canada. So, you get a sense of jurisdictionality problems. Licensing, I won't go over licensing <laughs> much because we could have lots of we could have a cage match. Yes, excellent. Steve and I'm going to have a cage match. Okay, so um, as I said, <laughs> right, so cities invested a huge amount of money in GIS. They didn't get money for that investment. So they have often used their geospatial data in the past to do cost recovery, to fund that. So you wonder why you can't access it even though you didn't pay enough tax dollar money. Well, they would argue that you didn't pay enough tax dollar money to give it back to you. Uh, so there's lots of reasons why in Canada you would be astounded what happens. Uh, we are governed under Crown Copyright Law in which if any government agency makes something that could be a profit to the queen, then the queen must profit. And it has created all sorts of odd situations where government agencies have to sell data to each other. And then they spend all their time figuring out how much a cadaster, uh, a single parcel costs, right? It doesn't make sense, but these are the legal regimes. Um, and people have been talking about it quite a bit here. Just to say that we have two uh, law professors, one of whom is actually looking at Canada's open government. That's actually an open data license. Um, and also, I thought you might be interested, uh, our research with the partners, uh, our partners in Canada have shown that 35% um, of them have uh, the buy in their current open data licenses. And 40% uh, have share alike in their licenses. So there are some potentials for compatibility with OSM's license. <clears throat> okay, so we veered from somewhat the pragmatic to the more philosophical and social theory, because that's the kind of girl I am. Uh, <clears throat> there is also an issue we in academia and others call neoliberalism. Uh, there is a huge push in cities to deregulate and to privatize. And um, so governments have less money. Open street map and volunteer geographic information looks very enticing. Um, you have too many regulations, get rid of them. Government should be looked upon as a platform. All it does is it delivers infrastructure, so data is like roads. So there should be a platform for releasing data and a platform for accepting data. Just provide it, and for everything else, get crowdsourcing. And this, since this is a do-it-yourself crowd, uh, this can sound somewhat appealing. But there is a cost to delegation to a do-it-yourself crowd, um, to a privatized government, to a pull back the curtains, and it's all owned by so-and-so corporation. 
including civil society organizations like OpenStreetMap. Um, if certain sections don't, of the tiles don't get updated, that can be a problem. Why can that be a problem? Well, there's this guy, Andrew Keene, and he wrote a book called The Cult of the Amateur. And he said, well, he said a whole bunch of stuff about how relying on amateurs is a problem. I don't necessarily buy some of his arguments, but one of the arguments he does make that uh, I find intriguing is that as governments rely increasingly on uh, volunteers, they start shedding employees. And we have seen this in British Columbia, in the environmental agency, where they have shed their field biologists. They don't necessarily tell you that they are relying almost entirely on volunteers to collect data. So they don't necessarily say, go collect data. They just don't have the facilities anymore to collect the data. So, <clears throat> What happens is you shed employees and if organization X no longer collects enough data, you don't have the employees to fill in the gap. Moreover, if it's volunteer, so it can be poor and unupdated data, especially in marginalized areas. Uh, moreover, uh, you can Say it's official if it's volunteered. You can say it's official when it comes from citizens when you need it. And you can say, oh, you should ignore it. It just comes from volunteers when it's convenient as well. With some of the things we're going to be looking at. So sometimes open government as a concept and open data can be very cynically employed. So um, we're in the process, we're in year two of investigating how um, cities and citizens interact via the geospatial web and open data. And we certainly hope it's not this, but something more like this. This is a mapping party in northern Quebec. And like this, this is a mapping party in Lachine in southern Quebec. Thank you. <laughs>